D. Now I come to verse 18a, where the harlot is called the great city, the palace. I have already made a few remarks on this with my rejection of the cultural opinion. I have yet this to add. This data by itself is not decisive for the ecclesiastical interpretation. Rome and the world state can also be called polis in the Greek New Testament. But this word does not plead against the thought of false church. The ecclesiastical meaning of the term is established by many in several places. Compare Schmidt's book. One particular place in connection with this, of great importance for the justification of my opinion, is Revelation 11 verse 8. Reverend Ploy assumes correctly that I believe, as well as he himself, that a great city always holds the same meaning throughout the book of Revelation. Therefore, also in 11 verse 8, I consider the text to be referring to the church city. Reverend Ploy does not agree with me. He writes, Yet may I remind you in all soberness that our Lord was not crucified in, but outside of Jerusalem and also not by Jerusalem, but by Rome. Thus many witnesses of the Lord may often be handed over by Jerusalem, the false church, but they are actually killed on the grounds of Babylon. Here he refers to what happened in the 16th and 19th centuries. The false church accused and provoked, but the state, city, executed. I will match Reverend Ploy in his solemnity. With his first comment he, I believe, has Hebrews 13 verse 12 in mind, where it says that Jesus suffered outside the gate in the form of the sacrificial law for the Day of Atonement. I also believe that this is a tremendously rich message, one which I have preached about with elation. But Reverend Ploy is not allowed to solve it in the following manner. He is killed outside the gate, he is outside Jerusalem, he is on the territory of Babylon. Does Reverend Ploy perhaps believe that in those days the jurisdiction of Rome ended at the walls of Jerusalem, so that inside Jerusalem would mean on the territory of the church and outside Jerusalem on the territory of the world city? Pilate had his residence inside the wall of Jerusalem and there he gave Jesus up to death on the cross. In other words, the author of the Bible never gave it a moment of thought that outside the gate must be understood as on the territory of the world empire. Hebrews 13 verse 12 does not contain a single argument against the thesis, the harlot is the false church. Concerning his second comment, I am well aware that the Jews needed authorization from Rome in order to execute this judgment. But I would never endorse his statement that Jesus is not crucified by Jerusalem, but by Rome. For Christ, in the interrogation before Pilate, condemns Jerusalem more than Rome. Compare John 19 verse 11. I will now use this opportunity to write down, in all soberness, some texts as well. Acts 2 verse 23. Him, Jesus, being delivered up by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you, Jews, nailed to a cross by the hands of unrighteous men and put to death. The church city executed the sentence of the cross, albeit through the hands of the Romans. Acts 3 verse 15 But you put to death the prince of life. Peter said this to the people of Jerusalem. Acts 4 verse 10 By the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene whom you crucified. Thus Peter spoke to the Sanhedrin. Acts 5 verse 30 Jesus whom you murdered by hanging him on a tree. Peter again to the Sanhedrin. Acts 7 verse 52 Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who previously announced the coming of the Righteous One, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. It is strange that Reverend Ployd thinks that I lack common sense when I consider John 11 verse 8 to point to Jerusalem. 
This last text is very important because here it is said that murder of prophets is not a single incident in the church city, but her practice. Just like Christ himself did say, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. Matthew 23 verse 37 All these verses strengthen me in my opinion that the great city in Revelation 11 is Jerusalem, the church city. This does not mean yet that the great city simply always points to Jerusalem. But I feel very strongly about this, especially on the grounds of Revelation 16 verse 19, where the great city is distinguished from the pagan cities. According to me, this favors again the opinion that by the great city in Revelation one should constantly think of the false church, also in Revelation 17 verse 18. Now we have arrived at the next point. E. It is said of the woman that she is the great city, which has the kingship over the kings of the earth. It looks like this is a major political addition. Yet questions do come up in my mind. For I can imagine that in this way there is spoken of one particular world city in ancient times. Nineveh, Babylon, Asher, and in John's days Rome. Thus there would be one particular place, distinguished from other places. In the opinion which I disputed, the great city is not seen as one city, which officiates as world center, but as world state, world dominion and world empire. Then it is understood that in this sense the great city has already been presented in the preceding chapter as a well-known greatness. But then I do not understand anything of the opposition which captures our attention here, for then we will get this paraphrase. The woman is the world empire which has dominion over the kings of the earth. What is the use then of this opposition? There is nothing in it which was not included in the great city already. It seems to me that this addition is totally senseless in that case. But something else is still more important to me. This world empire is still presented here as the beast with seven heads. And John says emphatically in 13 verse 3 that it received a deadly wound in one of its heads. In other words, the empire is collapsing at a given moment and to everyone's astonishment does not lift itself up again until later. I think this refers to the downfall of the Roman Empire. For more details, see my speech on the Church and the Last Judgment. At that time, for instance, one head did not make room for another, as had happened with the end of other world powers, so the empire could continue to exist in another form. Yet at that time the beast itself fell torpidly to the earth. For the time being it was not possible to speak of a world power anymore. And I am also of the opinion that John is also hinting at this in our chapter when he in verse 8 and 11 speaks of the beast which was and is not. Although the beast consequently lays fatally wounded on the earth, not to scramble to its feet until later, the woman is still going strong and playing her role. Her destruction does not come until at the beginning of the Eighth Empire. There is between the sixth and the seventh head of the beast a time without empire, but the woman exercises her dominion during this time as well as during the seventh empire. This makes it impossible for me to recognize the woman as a world power, for she is in full power also when the empire apparently had been ruined forever. Therefore, I still believe this to be strong grounds, besides the many other motives which I mentioned earlier, by which to distinguish beast and harlot, and to see this last figure as the false church, which herself exercises imperialistic power with her influence into all independent kingdoms, also in the ages when there is no empire. F. When the people of the Lord are told to go out from her, 18 verse 4 and further, we can understand this from a world city, but not from a world empire for it is not possible to withdraw from it. A person could leave the city of Rome, as well as the city of Nineveh, or Babylon, but no one can withdraw himself from the grasp of the world empire. 
Joseph and Mary could not escape from the power of Augustus and as such could not go out of the world empire. But this summons indeed becomes meaningful when we think of the great city of the false church as a concrete community within the world. It is possible to break the connection with her. This is why it appears to me that this verse is again decisively pointing into the direction of the ecclesiastical interpretation. G. This was already dealt with in the rejection of the cultural opinion, and actually it was also indicated already that there is no way of thinking of the harlot as world power, simply because this power still existed after the woman had already perished forever. The political structure is still complete at that time. Then one has to come to the conclusion it was the false church which was swept away forever. 8. This woman is said to be drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. 17 verse 6, 18 verse 20 and 24, 19 verse 2. Now it is remarkable that in 17 verse 6 a distinction is made between saints and witnesses of Jesus. I am aware that also New Testament believers often are called saints. The question yet enters my mind whether or not we are to think of the pious ones of the Old Testament here. This would not be strange in the chapter which has such strong lines of resemblance to Daniel 7, pertaining to the signs of the world empires. In this same chapter of Daniel, the pious ones of the Old Testament are several times referred to in the Dort Study Bible as the saints of the high places. Verse 18. Alders, in his court of verklaring, writes correctly, the saints of the Most High. There's a footnote. Thus also in the King James Version. This way of speaking still exists in the New Testament. Compare Matthew 27 verse 52 where it speaks of many bodies of the saints which had passed away and at the time of the death of Christ were raised. Then in our verse we would also have a classification of the believers. On the one hand the saints of the Old Testament and on the other hand the witnesses of Jesus as an indication of the martyrs of the New Testament. And thus we could come to the conclusion that the harlot, also in the days of the Old Testament, appeared as false judges and laid violent hands upon the lives of God's faithful children. Actually, even if the suggestion in connection to the term saints is not correct, I certainly will not give it that much authority, then the thesis that a harlot is the false judge which already operated in the days of the Old Testament still constantly receives a great deal of support from the texts mentioned. For, in 18 verse 20, it signifies that God, with the destruction of the harlot, settled the account she had with the holy apostles and the prophets. It is their judgment which the Lord executes over her. For, as it says in verse 24, in her is found the blood of the prophets and of the saints and of everyone who was slain on the earth. The prophets. These are undoubtedly God's ambassadors of the Old Testament. The saints, see above, perhaps the Old Testament believers. All who are slain on the earth would then be a summary of the New Testament martyrs. In any case, it is certain that a woman, already in the days of the Old Testament, played her role as murderess of God's servants and children. Now I will come back for a minute to my remarks on 2b. I was speaking there in connection with the sitting of the woman upon the seven kings from her historical position. 